Hi, this is Long. Welcome to our video series on search patterns for the most common studies in radiology. Please note that this is an introduction to study interpretation. An enormous amount of detail is omitted for brevity. Continue dedicated reading, seeing as many cases as possible, and keep getting feedback from subspecialists during the course of your training. Hey guys, so today we're going to talk about a basic approach to the MRI of the abdomen and pelvis. Uh, this sort of study is frequently done as a problem-solving exam. You'll frequently have a prior CT, ultrasound, or some other sort of study that will have seen an abnormality, or you'll be following a patient with some sort of known neoplasia, known abnormality, and we're trying to characterize it more fully. Sometimes this sort of study will also be used for staging um, and to detect uh, any sort of change in the care of a patient. A lot of, a lot of what we do, this sort of study for our institution, um, is to check for progression and treatment response of oncologic patients. So that's kind of a frequent uh, sin uh, scenario. Um, you know, as with all MRI uh, types of exams, it's really the kind of combination of what we're seeing across the various sequences that's going to allow us to characterize lesions. Um, and like, you know, with, again, with even like brain, chest, any other sort of MRI uh, imaging, a lot of times we're going to see a lot of more concerning pathology on T2-weighted imaging, fluid-sensitive imaging, uh, post-contrast imaging. Okay. Um, so the overall structure... Um, just to give a sense as to you know how we're going to approach this sort of study is that, uh, as with all exams, we're going to understand the patient indication, the history, you know, look at prior studies. It's, it can be particularly important if this uh, if you're doing this sort of study in the setting of oncologic care is to really understand the course of care, uh, the course of treatment, prior surgeries, um, medications. Uh, and these sorts of kind of contextual factors can really impact uh, what you expect to see and how you want to approach what you are seeing. Um, it can be particularly useful to understand your own institutional protocol, just have a sense of that so that you can have a, you know, be familiar with, you know, if are, are all the sequences that you expect are there, you know, and then have a sense as to what things really should look like so to get a sense also, you know, are things, uh, is the appearance of any sequence degraded by motion or other artifact, uh, susceptibility, things like that. And then it can always be good practice to check and see if your technologist has given you any specific additional information that it's impacting the quality of the exam. Um, it's always good practice to look at the localizers, and then we'll go through each of the, the image sets, you know, first starting at, with the T2 haste, you know, the DWI EPI images, um, and then we'll look at in and out of phase, and then pre, pre and post contrast T1, uh, frequently dynamic post contrast or different uh, time, fa um, time points, um, and kind of characterizing any sort of lesions or any abnormality across these various uh, uh, you know, imaging characteristics to, to come to kind of more, uh, more conclusive understanding of what's going on. Okay, so let's bring up our study here. Um, and I've, I've pre-hung this so that it's, uh, uh, things are a little bit organized and can be useful as always to kind of hang similar uh, you know, projections uh, you know, together. Um, so we're going to kind of go through, and I will show you this this you know this study. Um, it, so we have our localizers. We've got our T2 uh, haste here. We've got some DWI images. We've got T2 fat sat in and out of phase. Um, and then here I've hung on another screen. Um, I, I've uh, I've kept our haste images, and then I've done these are composed images, um, just of a single phase of contrast. And then I'll just you know broad broad strokes say that you know whatever search pattern we you talk about. I'm on post contrast, you know, or pre contrast T1, um, you know, we'll repeat for each of the time points and then put that all together. Okay, so we've got um, like a pre, uh, pre, -con um, pre contrast T1 fat sat, you know, a uh, post contrast, and then a subtraction image. Um, and this is for a single time point. And these are composed of both the abdomen and pelvis. The abdomen and pelvis were uh, obtained kind of separately. Okay, so uh, how are we going to approach this? Um, as always, it's good to start with the lower. Uh, or at least at some point uh, in the process, take a look at our localizers. And since this is an abdomen and pelvis, we're actually going to see a lot of this anatomy um, during the course of the exam, but it's always good practice to look where the other cross-sectional images may not cover. Uh, frequently, this will be like in the upper chest um, on the uh, localizers. And then, you know, if we're only doing the abdomen or just the pelvis, it's good to kind of check the, you know, the other side, um, you know, on those localizers. And then, We'll move to our uh, you know, T2 haste images, and and generally speaking, this you, you can kind of go through these and just make sure you're covering the anatomy similar to as you would on a CT study. Um, it can be useful to note um, that you know you're going to get some skipping, you know, but um, 
to go through and you know we'll start with the axials first and I'll bring these up is to you know cover the the lower chests uh, look at the lungs mesodynamic the heart and then go through and you're um, you know in both the axials and the coronals we're looking at the liver for cystic lesions for mass lesions abnormal sick you know a signal of any uh, nature different you know abnormalities of the contour um, you know we're looking at the hepatobiliary system you know the, the the biliary system and the gallbladder looking for stones which might be you know t2 hypo intense um, and you want to be you know careful looking you know both both um, on your coronals and your axials, uh, getting a sense of that overall morphology to see if you know if you can differentiate potential stones from flow phenomena, from air bubbles. Um, you know, are you looking for masses, polyps, um, abnormal dilatation, whether intrahepatic, uh, extrahepatic, involving the um, common bile duct. You know, all the way down. Um, you know, as as much as you can see it. Um, across these, the, the you know the images on the projection provided um, as it heads into the you know the the intrapancreatic course. Okay, and then we're going to look also at the pancreas um, as best you can see it, kind of you know on, on on your various projections. And I'm kind of showing you on two on on the two, but it can also be useful to just finish one and then and then go back to the other. Um, you're going to you know take a look at the pancreas, you know cystic lesions, mass lesions, ductal dilatation. Well, you know, looking at the spleen for the overall size, any, you know, also focal lesions there. You'll see the adrenals up here as, um, and then, and then the kidneys, uh, we're looking again at the, the morphology of these, we're looking for abnormal thickening of the adrenals. We're looking down at the kidneys for, you know, cystic or, ma you know, cystic lesions, mass lesions, um, looking for abnormal dilatation of the collecting system following the ureters down as you would normally um, looking for dilatation you know, intra, you know as much as you can see intralimal stones stones filling defects any sort of um, abnormalities along those lines similar down following the urinary tract to the bladder looking for wall thickening intraluminal lesion stones and then you know depending um, on uh, you know patient sex you're looking at you know whether in male patients or female patients we'll be looking at the reproductive tract uh, you know prostate seminal vesicles and testes in males patients we're looking for mass lesions inflammatory change things like that um, and then obviously you know in female patients will be you know assessing the uterus vagina ovaries um you know changes in contour looking for mass lesions looking for overall size and thickness of the junctional zone and you know we'll uh we'll kind of leave that as a little bit outside the, the full the scope of this kind of brief video and then it can be useful and again to, to the extent you uh able to just get a sense of the overall um if anything's going on in the peritoneum in terms of uh, fluid, if there's, you know, uh, abnormal signal, signal that makes you think air, any any nodes, or, um, we can also kind of get a sense as to other sort of, you know, and, uh, on, you know, when we ultimately look at the in and out of phase images, you can see susceptibility associated with air or things like that. These, these things are not going to be particularly common to see. Um, and then it can also be useful, and the kernels are particularly useful for this, is to go through the bowel as you would on a CT, you know, from, from all the way to the, you know, the esophagus, GE junction, stomach, small bowel, um, you know, and, and going through and looking all the way down to the large bowel, you may see the appendix, um, and then all following the large bowel all the way down, all the way through, and then, you know, to to the rectum, right? And, and, and as usual, we're looking for abnormal dilatation, for obstruction, for um, wall thickness, mass lesions, you know, uh, changes in caliber, inflammatory change, um, fistulous connections, you know, a adjacent collections, you know, this, the normal sort of things you'd look for on say CT. And again, we're, we're just talking about a broad generalized process to make sure that we're picking up all the abnormalities, right? And it can be useful, you know, and we're doing this in, in, in both these planes. Um, and we're just noticing that we can't always see, you know, this well because of like the, you know, the, the slice nature. Um, but just to make sure we're going through that. And then lastly, um, it'll be good to always take a look at the bones, this, you know, um, you know, on, on both planes, looking at the subcutaneous or uh, like the musculature, subcutaneous, other subcutaneous tissues. And, you know, one of the things that I kind of, um, it can be uh, easy to kind of gloss over is the external gen genitalia, uh, just making sure that at the edges of the study, we're looking, really looking at everything, okay? Um, and that kind of will take us through the T2, you know, like haste as like kind of a broad approach. And we'll kind of use a similar, you know, generalized approach just to make sure that we're looking, you know, when we go through the other imaging sequences that cover the similar anatomy that we are kind of looking, um, 
you know, in a similar kind of systematic fashion, okay? And I, what I will say too is that we have here, you know, I've kind of focused here on the T2 haste, but if we go through and we, we take a look at our, you know, DWI, uh, you know, kind of like, kind of, these are more like kind of like a low B value, um, uh, sort of, sort of, uh, kind of technical parameters here and this this particular sequence is going to be pretty helpful um, and again as we apply that same generalized search pattern but then again you know focusing maybe a little bit more on where we would see um, you know wh where we would expect lymph node stations to be um, so our DWI is going to be particularly helpful for picking up um, nodes, abnormal, you know, inflammation, um, you know, any sort of collections that are going to have debris, abscess, that sort of thing is going to be particularly helpful. So we're going to be correlating as we see things. You can correlate here, the DWI, and then just do a specific search here through nodal stations to make sure that we're being as sensitive as we can uh, for anything there. I want to know also that on, on this particular uh, protocol, we also have a T2 fat sat. Um, through the, just the upper abdomen, not the, uh, the pelvis. And this can be particularly helpful to kind of differentiate as we are seeing things um, between true fluid signal and then fluid signal safe from fat. Um, and so this can kind of help sort out, um, you know, um, correlating between them, um, really what is the contributor to uh, any sort of abnormal signal that we're seeing there, okay? Uh, the next thing we'll do is we'll head to our T1 in and out of phase uh, sequences. And these we are have obtained just through the upper abdomen. Um, you know, so here's out of phase, you can see what the India uh, ink artifact in phase. Um, and, and you know, it can be useful to kind of go through the upper abdominal um, kind of viscera and kind of like, a, you know, a, a, a fashion where you make sure you look at everything. Um, but most commonly what you, you know, um, what you will see is some signal loss on the out of phase images. You know, if, if there's gonna be, say, say hepatic cetosis, you'll see, you know, uh, loss of signal on the uh, out of phase images in the liver relative to the in phase images. Um, and you can use, you know, internal controls of like the, the spleen and musculature to, ha to help see that relative difference. Um, kind of among the other more common things you'll see, and you, you wanna just do make sure you're, you're looking at each of the organs on both of these, um, but among the other sorts of things you will see, um, kind of more commonly is if you do see an adrenal nodule, um, homogeneous uh, signal loss in a nodule is more characteristic of adenoma. And then kind of like that and yeah, ink outline um, for kind of more macroscopic fat can kind of help you characterize other lesions. Um, it's a couple other things to note is that for the uh, in phase uh, sequence, you know, this, this, if we, especially if we saw anything, uh, you know, previously is that this can help you pick up some marrow lesions. The in-phase images are, will also be particularly helpful to help you pick up, um, susceptibility artifact, you know, like blooming, um, these sorts of, you know, if, if this can help you sort out if you're seeing air, um, if there's any question of, uh, free air, pneumoperitoneum, pneumatosis, pearl gas, pneumobilia, and rare, you know, these rare sort of circumstances. If you're seeing um, what would could be susceptibility on other sequences, you can and you see if it blooms on the in phase images that can help you, you know, be more confident that something represents a clipper coil, blood product, these sorts of things. And and then again, looking at various sequences and even correlating to priors can be helpful there. Um, it, it can be useful to go through these kind of quickly in, in, uh, in the beginning, and then you can kind of return to them if you need to characterize anything between these two um, additionally, okay? So we've kind of covered everything on this screen, and then what we'll do next is I'm gonna bring us to the, you know, a layout where we've got, you know, I've, I've still got here our um, T2 haste, but then what I've d done is I've hung kind of composed pre-contrast um, uh, T1 fat sat, and then a post-contrast, um, and then a subtraction of the same time point. And frequently when we do uh, MRI imaging of the abdomen or pelvis, what we'll do is actually obtain um, multiple uh, phases of contrast. Uh, and, and again, you know, the exact protocol you'll, you'll use depends on the indication, what sort of lesion and what organ we're following, but it can be particularly useful to, uh, again, as a general principle to hang these together. And it can also be useful to, you know, as, as, especially if you have some sort of, um, uh, if there's some skipping or artifact is to be able to correlate this, you know, and just understand where you are in the anatomy. Um, 
uh, with you know uh, another kind of reconstruction. Now, um, of course, with any known lesion, you're going to take a look at that and characterize across the various sequences and according to the accepted lexicon for that suspected neoplasia. Uh, but as kind of like a general process to make sure we're seeing everything, um, it can be particularly good to go through you know the entire the anatomy. Um, at least, you know, briefly on these and, uh, you know, and to note, you know, as we're going through like the lower chest and the upper abdominal. Uh, abdominal, uh, upper abdominal solid organs, and then and, and then the uh, you know the pelvis and and the bowel and peritoneum, you know, and the various more you know uh, peripheral structures. Um, you know, we're going to do that on each of these, and, and and noting that if you are seeing some sort of T1 hyper you know hyper intensity on uh, pre contrast, that can you know kind of key you into something that you just want to be careful uh, to differentiate between inherent T1 signal and then enhancement on post contrast. Um, you know, if you are um, if you are seeing inherent T1 signal, this is kind of true of all, of all MRI. It can be useful to see you know use subtraction images, and you know in some cases these can be made for you by a technologist. Uh, in some scenarios, you can kind of create these on your own, uh, depending on the packs, um, and and that will give allow you to see whether you know to what extent it is really enhancing versus not enhancing. Um, and another kind of key consideration, as always, is is especially, you know, with MRI is, um, is that when you have subtraction images, you want to check to see the degree of registration, as you can see here, especially at the upper abdomen, where, you know, where you would expect some motion artifact from breathing, um, you kind of see some misregistration, right? And so just get a sense as to um, when you are seeing something on subtraction images, do you, you know, can you be confident in, uh, if, if, it, if it's real um, enhancement or is it um, an artifact of kind of misregistration between um, your post-contrast and your pre-contrast, right? Um, and, you know, as, as, as you see things, you know, uh, and, and frequently, uh, concerning findings will either enhance or have some sort of edema associated. It's, you know, it's, it's always, it's part of that process to again, again, look, look back, make sure we understand its signal characteristics across the various sequences, um, and then even putting it into the context of prior studies and then the overall patient presentation, of course. All right. So just to recap, um, a, you know, broad, sort of generalized approach to how we go about looking at an MRI in the abdomen and pelvis. You know, again, a lot of times you'll do either just an MRI of the abdomen or MRI of the pelvis, but here is kind of like an approach to understand what we're looking for on each sequence and how to how to organize that all together so that if we are looking for, you know, something that could appear anywhere, um, we are being kind of systematic about that approach. So um, as always, always good to understand really what's going on with the patient and not just, you know, taking a look at the study in purely in isolation and getting a sense also of uh, what, what is the, you know, overall, you know, any technical limitations or what we are, you know, what is, um, how does that impact what we can uh, really describe on the imaging study we're seeing and then being careful to always check the localizers, the edges of the studies. Um, I should mention actually uh, as part of that is that not just on the localizers, but on say coronal or if you are uh, obtaining like any sort of sagittal images, sometimes that field of view can be differing from the axial. So you want to be careful to to look at, especially at the edges of the film, uh, the study uh, uh, in that case. Going through, go, uh, looking at the T2 haste, the various um, reconstruction, you know, um, kind of image sets correlating with the fat satin images, the DWI, and then going through seeing where changes in signal intensity on T1 in and out of phase images can help you uh, understand, you know, fat content can understand, help you understand susceptibility. Um, and then going through the pre and post contrast images. And I just went through a single phase, but then to apply that um, to each of the phases of contrast that we get. And sometimes we'll, you'll do also like a, like a delayed, um, you know, and kind of, like, you know, where you're going to see excretion and then just understanding and, and, and going through all the anatomy kind of carefully in each of those and then putting that all together um, will kind of help you understand anything you're seeing uh, on an MRI of the abdomen and pelvis.